<laughs> oh my goodness. Hey crew, I've got the key to that 23 Audi S7. We are gonna take it for a drive, but first let's check it out. It looks on the inside and outside. Only modest changes for the 23 model year, including the addition of the design edition package that we have equipped on this car. Up at the front, there's black gloss for the hexagonal grille and for the four Audi rings. An S7 badge is to the left. This prestige trim adds the LED laser light technology with sequential turn signals. Those are above some functional cooling for the heat exchangers at the corners and non-functional air curtains off to the side. This vehicle is painted in gray arrow pearl, and I do like this color. Works well with the black gloss, classy but sporty. At the side are some edgy 21 inch wheels with the design edition. They're wrapped up in Pirelli P0 tires, 255 section front and rear. Within those wheels are some large and in charge steel brakes. And when you see the red painted calipers, it means you're looking at a car equipped with the S Sport package. Black gloss for the door mirrors and window trim. Stepping back to look at the profile, the gentle, elegant slope of the roof line right into the back of the car. The sides also showing off hard creases, high and low. Here at the back is an LED tail light bar spanning the full width beneath the blacked out Audi rings. It's also got sequential turn signals above S7 badging, a chunky black diffuser, and four chrome exhaust ports of the S Sport Packages Sport Tuned Exhaust. They really like the word sport. And I like the rear end view, but not as much as the first generation S7, which as opposed to the now roundedness of these taillights went for a hard cut line that looked so much edgier to me. And that leads me to my question, which design do you prefer, the first or second generation of the A7 S7? Let me know in the comments and let's check out the interior. Opening up, and looking inside at this black leather interior with red accents for the seat stitching and seat belts, thanks to the design addition. The rear seats are heated with the prestige package. On the doors, there's leather up top and this woven trim that looks like carbon fiber, but it's not. Still, it satisfies a tactile person like myself with the texture. Suede here, leather padding for your armrest with red stitching, down lows injection molding, and there's a Bang & Olufsen 3D sound system with the Prestige Pack. Stepping in, behind my own seat at six feet tall, I've got plenty of knee room. This is in hard plastic though, and this netted pocket is going to wear out easily. The foot pockets are also not that large, so thigh support is just sort of okay. Headroom is not though. So I've got my head pressed against the roof. I can't make it back to that headrest, and so it's gonna be a thumbs down from me. Here in the middle, we've got a four zone climate control system. And then down below are two USB-C ports and a DC outlet. This drive shaft dump is large and the pass through to swing your leg over is not wide. So I would not put a full size adult in the middle. Instead, we've got an armrest that comes down with deploying cup holders. And then about as much storage in this back console as we'll find in the front. Now let's go check out those front seats. Before I close this door, let me note that the Prestige Pack gives us dual pane glass and it also gives us the soft close function. So I don't really need to slam the door closed, but just for build quality's sake, let's listen to it. Good thud. Smart keel sentry is for the rear and front doors. These front seats have S logos on them. They're multi-way power adjusting. They are heated, though not ventilated, which is kind of surprising at this near $100,000 price point. We've got aluminum accented foot pedals, a bit of storage here, power adjustments for the tilt and telescope of the wheel, S aluminum tread plates. The front doors look very similar to the back. We add four one-touch windows, power adjusting and power folding door mirrors. And down here is a release for your power operated lift back. 
And I love how high it comes, and you can adjust that height as well, giving you a nice wide access point. This is the practicality of the S7's design. If you wanna fold down the rear seats, 40, 20, 40, you can do that, but you can't really easily reach the release points. You've gotta go around to the side doors and then fold them almost completely flat. There's a power close and lock function on the tailgate. Before hopping in the driver's seat, I will point out the large sunroof, though it's not panoramic even on this range topping trim. And there's also two positions of memory for the driver's seat. Soft closing up this door. And looking at the steering wheel. With the design edition, it's got perforated leather, flat bottom and red contrast stitching. It feels excellent in the hands. These aluminum paddles on the back of the wheel don't have a ton of travel, but they feel solid. Here we find reconfigurations for the digital gauge cluster. There's a head-up display with prestige and extended leather up on the dashboard. More of that carbon fiber style weave, some gloss black and a quattro badge on the passenger side. Twin screen setup, the upper one operating most of your infotainment functions, and it's got Haptic feedback so you know your message has been received along with wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. The bottom screen is dedicated to climate and some shortcuts. Physical volume knob is on the right, start stop button on the left, perforated leather topping for your gear selector, two cup holders, DC outlet and a key slot, plus some gloss black in not a great spot. It will smudge, it will scratch, it will collect dust. Leather topping with red stitching on your console. And here's what I meant about storage. We do get a wireless charging pad with Prestige and two USB-C ports, but this is all the storage you have in the console. Otherwise, you're stashing your goodies in the door pockets. Visibility is quite good, and there's standard blind spot monitoring with rear cross traffic. This cabin is sophisticated. It's solidly constructed. It has just enough sporty touches to make it feel special. Now we need to see how the S7 drives. All right, let's fire it up. Nice little trumpet from the sports exhaust on startup. And yes, I did find another way to use the word sport in this review. Our drive mode selection is here, and I wish it was duplicated somewhere on the wheel as like a dial or something, because you do have to find the right up or down button while you're driving, which can sometimes be a bit distracting. And only when you hit continue will you actually see your drive select options. We've got auto comfort, dynamic or individual, which I've just missed. There it is, where you can customize things like your throttle response, suspension, steering, and the exhaust sound. We're gonna start out in auto mode. Then to go in reverse, click in and press forward. That brings up a high resolution camera system, bird's eye view off to the right, and then a variety of camera angles to choose from here on the left, including a wide angle, some wheel views, and a 3D projection that you can scan around. Let's go back to the wide angle for the rear and back it on out. down into drive and away we go let's start things off with a world famous horn test oh yeah yes classy asserts itself appropriately and how about the turn signal sound traditional a little loud for my taste powertrain in the s7 it's a 2.9 liter twin turbocharged V6. This motor is used in a variety of Volkswagen Auto Group vehicles. Here, it makes 444 horsepower and 443 pound-feet of torque. It is routed through an eight-speed torque converter automatic and sends power to all four tires permanently. Because peak torque comes in nice and early, it doesn't require much throttle input to quickly accelerate you up to speed 
and then very light maintenance throttle to keep that momentum. The eight speed is quite smooth in the way it works between the gears. And the auto mode is a nice blend of responsive throttle, but not overly excitable throttle. The brake pedal. Very easy to modulate. And the start stop system is easy to turn off. I like that there's a button right here. It's rather a touch sensitive button. But if it bothers you, which it hasn't really bothered me, you can easily just hop in and turn that off. I wish it stayed off between driving sessions after you turn it off, but it comes right back on each time you start the vehicle. Seat comfort is solid. The seats are very ergonomic, multi-way adjustable. The seat padding is a little on the firm side though. So I do wonder if a long stint behind the wheel, my max that I've spent in one session in this car is about an hour and a half. I wonder if any longer, if you wouldn't start to feel some numbness in your tuchus. It's just so great as a cruiser. And we could try out comfort mode as well. See if that relaxes the equation even more. Turning radius now. Passes the test with flying colors. Oh, I like that little burble on the upshift, even in comfort mode. But yes, the turning radius is phenomenal in the S7 thanks to a rear wheel steering system that is part of the S Sport package. Comfort does slacken up the throttle response just a little, but not enough that you couldn't, again, easily get up to speed. Ride Comfort is stellar in the S7. We've got adaptive dampers with air springs. And though you definitely understand what's going on with the road surface, that's communicated in through the chassis. The big bumps just come through as mere ripples, never truly disturbing you. And once again, proving that the S7 is a phenomenal daily driver. How is it as a sports machine though? We're gonna see it with a real world zero to 60 test up next. For that, I've got my race box set up here and to enter launch control, we need to move into the dynamic drive mode. That puts us into the sport powertrain setting. We also need to hit the traction control button once, putting us in stability control sport. From here, I just hold my foot hard on the brake while pinning the throttle. It'll build up the revs. Let go of the brake and see how we do. Here we go. Swift 4.0. Four seconds to 60 with a slight uphill. You know, I'd say this car really has an attraction to the number four, I mean, 444 horsepower, 4.4 seconds to 60, but really it should get to 60 in 4.2 seconds. That's what Audi says, and that's what independent tests have backed up. And in the mid range, Yowza! It quickly dropped down two gears and put us in the meat of the power. We're also getting some more theater from that exhaust system. Hardier with burbles of overrun. Still doesn't sound as good as the V8 this car once had, but for a V6, Is not bad. And the thrust is much more than just not bad. It is prodigious.
This thing kicks. <laughs> oh my goodness. And I'm savoring that soundtrack. I frankly just want it up a few more decibels. And a kick to the right with the gear selector puts us in manual mode. Let's see if they'll let us go all the way out to red line. Ah, it upshifted for me. Okay, so if you work with it, you can pull the paddle early and still retain manual control, but it sucks that you have to work around the auto upshift. And the gear changes themselves are not that immediate. You pull the paddle and wait pretty much a full second for it to actually change gear. Not horrible, but not as hasty as I would like. Let's explore the braking and handling next. First, I'm going to turn off stability control completely, holding that button there. And while remaining in dynamic and sport, we'll carry some speed into this curve before I clamp down hard on those brakes. Nice response from those. Solid feel from the pedal. Quick turn in, very stable here. We'll bring the back end around with liftoff. And then the torque vectoring rear differential will distribute that power at the rear axle and shove us out of the corner with speed. Let's go for round two here. stable. The steering is light, yes, and not brimming with feedback, but it's far from numb. The tires are still talking through this wheel. And the S7 shines as a performance machine. The standouts for me were one, the braking, tenacious braking force and great feedback through the brake pedal and then the way it got the power down with the all-wheel drive system and the torque vector and rear differential. Let's get into the miles per hour word of the day now. For the 23 Audi S7, the word that comes to mind is suave, meaning charming and confident, because this car charms you with its outside and inside aesthetics and its ride composure, and then it exudes confidence with the way that it handles and the way it hurdles down the roadway with all of that power. Here on the highway, let's quiet up for a moment and listen for the NPH level. Including that change of road surface to this now louder surface, the S7 is so subdued in the cabin, the dual pane glass of the Prestige package keeps the wind noise down. Even on these 21 inch wheels, there's not a lot of tire noise. It's splendid inside this cabin at speed. And you do have adaptive cruise control with steering assist that will keep you centered in the lane. It's not really a hands-free system, but it doesn't ping-pong you in the lane when you have your hands off for a second. Now to discuss pricing and competition, rather before we talk pricing and competition, let's review fuel economy and top speed. The fuel economy of the S7 is 19 MPG in the city, 26 on the highway, and 22 combined. The top speed is 155 miles per hour. The starting price of the premium entry-level trim of the S7 is about 85,000 bucks if you want the Prestige, the range topper, it's around 93 grand. And this vehicle as tested with a few options is a shade under 100,000 bucks. 
Competitors for the Audi S7 include the BMW 8 Series Grand Coupe and the Mercedes AMG GT. And while the 444 horsepower in the S7 puts this closer in terms of power to the BMW M850i and the AMG GT53, the price point of this car actually aligns better with the 840i and the AMG GT43. So the 840i Grand Coupe starts at about 88,000 bucks. It makes just 335 horsepower, gets to 60 in 4.8 seconds, has a top speed of 155 miles per hour and fuel economy of 24 combined. The AMG GT43 starts at 97,000 bucks, makes 367 horsepower, gets to 60 in 4.3 seconds, has a top speed of 168 miles per hour and fuel economy of 21 combined. An objective look at those numbers definitely favors the Audi S7, but subjectively what's going on here? Aesthetically, on the exterior, if it was the previous generation S7, it would be the clear winner for me. But this generation S7, a little too rounded for my liking, it's the 840i that I think has the best sportiest, there's that word again, proportions. The S7, not bad, still better looking to my eyes than the AMG, but not quite as cool as the 8 Series. Interior-wise, this is definitely the cleanest and probably the most user-friendly, but the AMG GT makes you feel the most special from behind the wheel. In terms of performance, the 8 Series, probably the most entertaining to work through curves, but in a straight line, the S7 would leave those two for dead, and it's still fun to drive when you find yourself staring down a canyon road. I think the S7 is the clear winner in this segment. It's an incredible value. It's in fact probably one of my favorite daily drivers for under $100,000, really blending performance and style and comfort flawlessly. Which would you guys choose though? Would you have the Audi S7? Would you have the 840i Grand Coupe? Or would you have the AMG GT43? Let me know in the comments. I hope you guys have enjoyed this POV Drive review. If you did, please like, comment, and share it. Subscribe to the channel and hit that bell to get notified. And I'll see you next time.